Hey there guys, happy Easter and a warm welcome to the Holy Shed. I hope that you're having or that you've had a lovely Easter day and I wish you all the very best, you and your families at this special time of the year. Last week I had the great pleasure and honour of preaching on Monday Thursday at St Leonard's, our home church in South London. Um, I love Monday Thursday, it was an amazing service, I love being part of it. Um, but my talk basically focused on the thought that if anyone imagines that the life and message of Jesus isn't truly and deeply political, well, they need to look again. Um, so if that intrigues you, the talk will be available soon and I will put a post up for it uh, as soon as I can. Um, it's a bit different today to usual, not least because you're going to see a bit less of me, but still hear plenty. And um, I'm not going to delve into all the sort of doctrinal and theoretical stuff about the resurrection. I've done all that numerous times and I probably will again in the future. But um, if you want to check out what I think about all of that, there are chapters on the resurrection of Christ in my books, Reenchanting Christianity and also Black Sheep and Prodigals. Um, just to say that really, you know, to be honest, what happened to the flesh? and bones of Jesus 2,000 year, years ago is of very little interest to me at all. And I have no idea why people get so hot under the collar uh, on this subject and demand your absolute allegiance to their particular uh, interpretation and understanding of it. Because actually, I think um, the, the, the physical remains of what happened to the physical remains of Jesus are of little real consequence to us as we get on with our lives together to, to today. The only thing that really matters, and it's why I joyfully proclaim Christ is risen, is that the disciples experienced Christ as alive, and that transformed their lives completely, and the world uh, in many ways as a consequence. Also what matters is that many people today, including myself, experience the living presence of Christ in, uh, in in transformative ways. And that, I think, is all that really matters. Not arguments about, you know, an empty tomb, which can be a huge distraction from the important task of how we can incarnate the living presence of Jesus in our lives and in our communities today. That's really all that matters, I think, or what supremely matters. So enough said about all that. Uh, in recent times, I have been drawn very much to this phrase, practicing resurrection, treating resurrection not as a noun, an event or something in the past or a doctrine to be argued about and, um, you know, kind of analysed and so on, but rather resurrection as a verb, as something to be experienced and practised in the present. Um, I first stumbled on that phrase, practising resurrection in a poem by Wendell Berry who is a poet, he is a poet, uh, a farmer and a, a big environmental activist and in one of his poems uh, he, he talks about this and the poem is wonderfully called Manifesto, the Mad Farmer Liberation Front and, uh, and here it is. Um, now I'm not going to read all through that uh, right now because I'm going to play you somebody else reading it in a moment but just to say, you know, the first chunk, the first paragraph is basically the poet's summary of a life governed by money, by materialism, by corporate, the corporate American dream. He, he is an American and he's really sort of saying, you know, if you if you if you're going to be driven by all that that society and that culture expects of you, then really you're going to be living in a tomb of spiritual death. And the rest of the poem is this magnificent description of, or an incitement to live in a resurrection way, outside of the box of societal expectations. It's about living authentically. It's about basically giving a shit about people, about nature. Um, it's about truly being alive instead of walking around semi-comatose. And then it's finally you know, all summed up in that last line um, about practising re resurrection. It is revolution. Um, it's a long poem and it needs quite a bit of reading and thinking about. So what I'm going to do is play you what I think is the best ever rendition 
certainly that I've ever heard of this poem by an American actor and producer called Evan Coons. And I love this. I love it to bits. Just take a listen to this and have a look too. Love the quick profit, the annual raise, vacations with pay, want more of everything ready-made, and be afraid to know your neighbors and to die. And you will have a window in your head. Not even your future will be a mystery anymore. Your mind will be punched in the card and, and shut away in a little drawer. When they want you to buy something, they will call you. When they want you to die for profit, they will let you know. So friends, Every day do something that won't compute. Love the Lord, love the world. Work for nothing. Take all that you have and be poor. Love someone who doesn't deserve it. Denounce the government and embrace the flag. Hope to live in that free republic for which it stands. Give your approval to everything you cannot understand. Praise ignorance for what man has not encountered, he has not destroyed. Ask the questions that have no answers. Best in the millennium, plant sequoias. Say that your main crop is the forest that you did not plant, that you will not live to harvest. Say that the leaves are harvested when they have rotted into the mold. Call that profit. Prophesy such returns. Put your faith in the two inches of humus that builds under the trees every thousand years. Listen to Carrion. Put your ear close and hear the faint chattering of the songs that are to come. Expect the end of the world. Laugh. Laughter is immeasurable. Be joyful, though you have considered the facts. And so long as women don't go cheap for power, please women more than men. Ask yourself, will this satisfy a woman satisfied to bear a child? Will this disturb the sleep of a woman near to giving birth? Go with your love to the fields. Lie easy in the shade. Rest your head in her lap. Swear allegiance to what is nighest your thought. As soon as the generals and the politicos can predict the motions of your mind, lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark the false trail, the way you didn't go. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction. Practice resurrection. Gideon Hurt. That is so freaking amazing. And, you know, I think you're probably going to want to flip back on your video and have another listen or three or four to that. Um, it, it is a piece of like, well, it's dense with incredible sort of ideas and, um, and statements about basically living life in reverse. Go the other way. That's resurrection life, right? is to get out of the groove of where so much of the world is, is likely to take you and just find that different path. And Evan, you know, presents it like an Old Testament prophet. I think it's absolutely incredible. So anyway, what I'm going to do today, quite simply, is share with you, uh, inspired somewhat by that poem, by that last line, my six Easter notes to self in the hope that, um, you know, they will be of some use to you too. So here's the first one. My first note to self, Easter note to self, is keep room in your mind for the unexpected. Keep room in your mind for the unexpected. That's about as resurrection a thought as you could find, right? Uh, the, his followers thought that Jesus was gone from their lives forever, right? And the unexpected happened. The two on the road to Emmaus said it plainly, but we had hoped that he was the one. And now hope was gone, dreams were shattered. We had hoped, but then something extraordinary happened. And however you understand that or interpret it, they encountered the living Christ in their hearts in a way that was utterly transformative. And uh, it transformed everything. Um, and yet the reality is that resurrection is a reality in our whole world, really. Um, 
you know, ev every every single year we see resurrection happening in the way that nature all falls to the ground, becomes barren, withers, dies, and then spring comes. And so that, you know, what what Jesus, the story of Jesus has these massive reverberations or connections with with a principle that is at work in the world all the time. So I think what we should take with us throughout this Easter season and beyond is the realisation that the unexpected can and sometimes does happen. You know, it's about hope. It's about defiance. Um, it's about imagination. Mary Oliver says it rather wonderfully in a poem. Well, this is part of a poem called Evidence. She says, where do I live? If I had no address, as many people do not, I could nevertheless say that I lived in the same town as the lilies of the field and the still waters. Spring, and all through the neighbourhood now, there are strong men tending flowers. Beauty without purpose is beauty without virtue. But all beautiful things inherently have this function, to excite the viewers toward sublime thought. Glory to the world, that good teacher. Among the swans, there's none called the least or the greatest. I believe in kindness, also in mischief, also in singing, especially when singing is not necessarily prescribed. As for the body, it is solid and strong and curious and full of detail. It wants to polish itself. It wants to love another body. <clears throat> it is the only vessel in the world that can hold, in a mix of power and sweetness, words, song, gesture, passion, ideas, ingenuity, devotion, merriment, vanity and virtue. Keep some room in your heart for the unimaginable. Keep some room in your heart for the unimaginable. <clears throat> I love that statement because it puts the onus on us, right? Keep, you must do it. It's the verb bit. Keep some room. Don't allow that space of imagination and expectation to be squeezed out, to be eliminated through despair or through sadness or loss keep it keep it keep some room so reading right on from that really my second uh, easter note to self is commit to hope live defiantly even when you feel despairing and the issue here is that word the first one commit because remember, what we're talking about is practice. We're talking about a noun. Resurrection is a noun. Commit. It's about deciding not to allow yourself to be defined by the worst things in the world around you. Not to be defined by negative circumstances. Or by, you know, the despair that you yourself sometimes feel. Commit to something different. Um, commit to hope. And here's, here's a prayer from my OMG book of prayers, uh, which is all about hope. Sometimes hope smoulders in the secret place of the heart, biding its time, discharging the gentle fragrance of defiance. Sometimes hope fires the imagination like a blazing furnace, flame burning doubt and despair sometimes hope roars a hell shaking belly laugh full in the face of a future we cannot predict or control god grant us assurance that nothing is fixed the future is open hope can make the difference It's important, isn't it? We've been thinking in the past weeks uh, in the Holy Shed about the future being open, about process and that everything is in a state of becoming. And hope is 
and the defiant imagination within us is that which can see this. It can help us to impel us forward into the future positively and hopefully. You know, as the prayer is saying, hope comes in different forms at different times. But it's still hope. It isn't always a great blazing light. Sometimes it just smoulders. But it's in our hands to keep fanning even the smouldering expression of hope. To keep it alight. To keep it moving. My third Easter note to self is look for beauty in ordinary things. Because sometimes resurrection's right there in front of us. It's living before us in the people that we're with. In the daily routines that we just kind of pass over without a thought. In the beauty of nature all around. Look, look for beauty. Look for it. There's the verb. Something we need to do. It's about bringing our attention in. Focusing attention. Making ourselves be aware of the hopeful beauty which is already present in the ordinariness of our lives. Being consciously or intentionally grateful is a key part of this. It's a key to staying awake or mindful to beauty and hope in our lives, stirring up gratitude within. Carrie Newcomer, who is no newcomer to the Holy Shed, certainly to soul spaces, she talks about a little practice that she has in a poem about um, gratitude and, and looking for beauty in ordinary things. Enjoy this. Every night before I go to sleep, I say out loud three things that I'm grateful for. All the significant, insignificant, extraordinary, ordinary stuff of my life. It's a small practice and humble, and yet I find I sleep better holding what lightens and softens my life ever so briefly at the end of the day. Sunlight and blueberries, good dogs and wool socks, a fine rain, a good friend, fresh basil and wild phlox, my father's good health, my daughter's new job, the song that always makes me cry, always at the same part, no matter how many times I hear it decent coffee at the airport, <laughs> and your quiet breathing, the story she told me, the frost patterns on the windows, English horns and banjos, wood thrush and June bugs, the smooth, glassy calm of the morning pond, an old coat, a new poem, my library card, <laughs> <laughs> and that my car keeps running despite all the miles. And after three things, more often than not, I get on a roll and I just keep on going. I keep naming and listing until I lie grinning, blankets pulled up to my chin, awash with wonder at the sweetness of it all. see it as something that's quite ordinary, part of our ordinary life, looking for beauty in ordinary things. My fourth Easter note to self is about being kind, being kind to oneself. Um, and, you know, you have to take note of the fact that this is also a practice. And the thing about practice, a practice, is that you have to practice it. You do it. It's not necessarily something that comes natural. It may actually be running counter. It may feel counterintuitive. Um, it's not necessary to, not necessarily about having a feeling of kindness toward oneself. Emotions can come and go. But it's about be kind. Be kind to yourself. Stop behaving as if you don't matter because you do matter. You know? You matter certainly to God. In the great scheme of things, your life matters. And you matter to other people too. So please, dispel from your you know, mind any Christian mentality that says that focusing on yourself 
on your own feelings and your own needs is in some way sinful or selfish, you know? Remember what it says, love your neighbour as yourself. Love your neighbour as yourself. If we don't love ourselves, we're not going to be able to love other people properly. I finish the Holy Shed, don't I, week in, week out, with this statement, be kind, be kind to yourself. And I stress that over and over again because I know how hard it can be for some of us to accept, to embrace and to practice. But guys, it is through practicing that we learn to be properly kind to ourselves. It's a There's a huge difference between self-esteem and self-love in the in that true sense and being selfish you know where it is all about me that's a, that's a different thing altogether but um take a look at this wonderful little piece by john o'donohue it's from his amazing book anamkara and of course anamkara means soul friend and it's it's good and it's right that we find soul friends and that we are a soul friend to other people but the challenge of this note to self is you know, can I be my own soul friend? So this is what he says. If you allow yourself to be the person that you are, then everything will come into rhythm. If you live the life you love, you will receive shelter and blessings. Sometimes the great famine of blessing in and around us derives from the fact that we're not living the life we love. Rather, we are living the life that is expected of us. We've fallen out of rhythm with the secret signature and light of our own nature. So beautifully put. So it's about, yeah, making a practice of being kind to ourselves. But then we can build on that and say number five is about being kind to others, being kind to strangers as well as friends. I mean, don't you love it when someone, a stranger, is unexpectedly kind to you? Isn't, isn't that a great thing when suddenly someone you don't know, and it may be a small gesture, but it's them noticing that you are there, they see you. They recognise you and they respect you enough to say a kind word or just do a little kind thing. It's a great thing. And doesn't it feel improbably satisfying when you do a kindness to a stranger? That's also a great thing. It just, you know, it lifts, lifts your heart in the middle of what might be an otherwise tedious day. And I often say that kindness is love in action. Want to know what love is? Love, when we look at it in its active form, comes out as kindness. Kindness is a very similar word to grace, by the way, and, you know, we know the implications that has. The grace of God is the kindness of God. Love can be such an airy-fairy word, you know, a sentimental word, pink and fluffy and all that. But kindness has got a robustness to it. Kindness is practical. It's what love looks like in practice. But in her incredible poem on kindness, the Palestinian poet Naomi Shabab Nye says that in order to be kind, we also need to know sorrow and loss. That's what gives depth and substance to our kindness, because kindness is also an expression of empathy, which is our capacity to identify with the other person, often recognise ourselves, our own vulnerability, in that of the other person. Um, this, is, this is her poem. And incidentally, she says that she wrote this uh, on an occasion when she and her partner were, were, had just boarded a bus. They were on, doing a sort of traveling holiday thing together and all of their documents and all of their money was stolen. And in that place of loss and despair, a total stranger came alongside and was kind to them. And she says that she heard this poem. She picked it out of the air. She said it was like a, a voice spoke this poem into her. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. 
feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how desolate the landscape can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop. The passengers, eating maize and chicken, will stare out of the window forever. In other words, you live as if nothing's going to change. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows and you see the size of the cloth. Then it's only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for, and then goes with you everywhere, like a shadow or a friend. Beautiful, beautiful poem. So I come just to my last one. Last note to self, which is, be the change you wish to see in the world. There's not a really lot to say about this. It doesn't need a lot of explaining. It just needs a lot of doing. It's no good me sitting around moaning about stuff in the world or in other people around me. The big question is, for all of us, is what kind of world do we wish to live in? And then get on with living that in our own little corner of the world. You know, remember the butterfly effect, just flap your little wings and encourage others to do the same. That's how change comes about. Here's a little piece that I love to bits and try constantly to live into. It's by Deepak Chopra, an American Indian writer and all round good egg and wise person. Um, this is this is this is him saying what he thinks about this. I will, I will see, see a stranger, stranger today, today through, through the eyes, eyes of, of compassion. compassion. I will, I will remind, remind myself, myself, that myself that this stranger, stranger has, has parents, parents and people, people who love her, her just, just like, like me. me. I will I remind, remind myself, myself that this stranger, stranger has, has moments, moments of joy, joy just, just like, like me. me. I, will I will remind myself. myself that this stranger has moments of anguish and suffering, just like me. I will remind myself that this stranger will one day grow old, just like me. I will remind myself that this stranger will go through the cycles of illness and recovery, just like me. I will remind myself that this stranger will one day die. Just, just like, like me. me. Through, Through the, the eyes, eyes of, of compassion, compassion, I will I know this stranger, stranger not, not as a stranger, stranger anymore, anymore, but as a living soul. Just, just like, like me. me. Sick things that I'm thinking about as I ponder what Easter is going to mean for me going forward. Um, nothing new, but things that I want to reaffirm a commitment to inside. Now, I'll finish this with just this incredible image here. What a beautiful, beautiful photograph by an Australian woman called Carolyn Hyde. And um, 
she she wrote to me i asked her about this photograph and she wrote to me and said um, you know she lives in the blue mountains of new south wales and there'd been this prolonged bushfire which had burned everything swathes of native vegetation that surrounded their house was burned to the ground and after the fires um, and it was safe to go out they they went to she and her husband went to one of their favorite walks um, nearby and um, she said her husband Neil you know and, and and she were talking about the resilience of our native plants and the birds and the animals that had survived the inferno and suddenly her husband saw this rosella crimson rosella sitting on a charred branch and she just grabbed her camera and caught this picture and she said many people have seen this photo and been moved by the imagery and it has this sense of resurrection about it and you think of all of that wonderful stuff in the mad um the manifesto i read at the beginning and you know this is this is a little creature who's going against everything that's round about and bringing beauty and fresh life into a place of of de deadness that to me is like an icon of the resurrection okay well i'm gonna just propose a toast um i have with me a cup of tea it's the most i can take at the moment and uh, if you're going to drink i'd like you to join me as we think about these things in a toast to easter toast to the risen presence of jesus in our lives and in the world around a toast to the practice of resurrection to all who strive toward and manifest the different way that Jesus showed and stood for, um, even when it's really, really hard and painful and difficult for them to do it. Um, to life, Lachaim. Grace, well, that's a bit different today. Um, and I just wanted to share those thoughts with you. Um, hope that hope you find them helpful and you know if you like what I'm doing in the shed you can support us you can buy us a coffee and um, you just have to follow the link that's on the screen there and it's very easy to do and we are just so grateful to all of you who support us like that and in lots of other ways too it means it means a great deal to us and that's just about it really for this week um, you know uh, my book is still on sale everywhere on Amazon. You can buy them from us too, from our, from the coffee shop. If you want to sign copy, do please tell me, uh, send a direct message to me if you want me to sign it to a particular person and I'll be very happy to do that. So uh, I'm going to finish really with uh, a prayer which I put out this morning on Facebook, which is um, my kind of another, another off the wall Easter reflection, I guess you'd call it. So, um, you know what you've got to do, don't you? Get out there, be kind to the world, be kind to yourself and um, stay human in the truest and best sense. And I'll see you soon. If I knew I would die tomorrow, a prayer for Easter morning. If I knew I would die tomorrow, which may not be a bad thought to entertain since it reminds us how precious life is and how spectacularly we take it for granted. I think I'd try to track down a ring ousel because I've never seen one of them. I'd probably whiz up to Swaledale for another pint of Theakston's Old Peculiar, which I expect will be on draft in the hereafter, but who can tell? I would email lots of friends to say I love you and tell them how they've helped to make my life the most spectacular ride imaginable. I would organise a massive, beautiful dinner party and cook a huge pan of Liverpudlian scouse with apple crumble and custard to follow. I would definitely lock eyes with my beloved and share with her the biggest belly laugh ever in gratitude for the love and hilarity we have shared. I would fit in some time in my famous garden shed, which so magnificently helped me through the lockdowns and birthed a digital village, which I never expected and will never forget. I believe in Easter. I believe Easter 
is a great shout of joy waiting to be born each and every day in mostly ordinary, unobtrusive, yet utterly awesome ways. I believe in fresh opportunities, new chapters and unexpected outcomes. I believe that however dark the winter, spring will always spring again, heralded by a dazzling choir of birdsong. Don't, for God's sake, let it go unnoticed. I believe Easter announces that life will never finally end. There you go, guys. Uh, it's on Facebook, so if you share it round with your friends, that would be great. But um, have a good week. I'll see you soon. Lots of love. Bye.